So let's start. Um, we are a bit in advance, uh, but we are still respecting the 15 academic. Oh, I can pull off the mask. That's a liberation, thank you. <laughs> so um, we are keeping with the tradition that we started a few years ago of having some outstanding lectures in the field of immunology, I'm saying. Um, I remember you, we hosted here at the Nobel Prize, Jean Ellison, for um, the uh, Laurea Donorum. And uh, he talked about the, uh, the conquest uh, of immunotherapy. Um, now we are, have the privilege of uh, um, hosting another person who has shaped the way we live, uh, thanks to the immunology. Uh, Professor Ozanam Turechi is here because uh, a few years ago, before the pandemic, when we didn't have any idea that this was possible, we organized a winter school, uh, a collaboration between the German um, uh, Society for Immunotherapy, KIMT, and Oslam is the president, and uh, um, the PhD school uh, in life and health science at the time I was uh, president of the PhD school. So the idea was to uh, train early career scientists specifically in the field of uh, cancer immunology and immunotherapy. So everything was stopped uh, because the school had the winter school had to occur had to start in, in uh, March and we were in lockdown in February. So this is the first time we are rejoining and convening in presence for a summer school that is going on uh, in Ilasi. And uh, uh, we have 24 students from all over the world, from 12 different countries that are participating at the moment. So. Uh, graciously, um, she agreed to give us a lecture. Just a few words for those of you who don't know uh, Oslem. She is professor of personalized immunotherapy, right? In Mainz University, the University Medical Center in Mainz, uh, but also at the Tron. And uh, she has founded uh, different companies. She founded uh, Ganymed, uh, and she was uh, CEO of that company. And she founded what you know probably better, um, a company called BioNTech that um, has uh, contributed uh, to the race for vaccine discovery. But this is just part of what Oslem has contributed to the scientific community. She has worked on uh, antibodies against cancer. She has worked on vaccine against cancer. She is now working on different therapies including CAR T. And uh, you think that, you know, this is a classic um, PhD uh, uh, CV, but she is a physician. And I will never forget uh, one of the first time we met, she told me something that um, makes a lot of sense to me. I'm an MD too. Um, we need to find a cure, an option for those patients who don't have any. So this has been her motivation and the motivation of her husband, uh, Ugu Sain, who is co-founder of the company. And I remind you that she was leading and, and they are still leading the uh, light speed project, right? Who allowed in less than one year to have a vaccine that has been uh, administered worldwide. Today, she will talk about this technology the RNA technology, and we are collaborating on this technology as University of Verona in uh, covering different aspects for cancer immunotherapy to infectious diseases uh, prevention. And again, uh, thank you for accepting the invitation. So thank you very much. Uh, first of all, for co-hosting -host, the Kind Summer School here in Verona, uh, which is really a great experience. And for inviting me to this um, lecture uh, uh, here at this wonderful university and also for your kind and flattering words, which 
speak more to our friendship and how uh, and its nature than uh, to any of my uh, of my merits here. Uh, I will talk about mRNA technology in my lecture and how uh, it um, contributes uh, to um, cancer immune therapy where it started and to infectious disease uh, prevention and uh, what um, our team uh, in MINDS um, uh, contributed to this field. Our contribution started, can I move this? Yeah, our contribution started in the 1990s with a vision. As uh, uh, Enzo has pointed out, we are physicians and immunologists. So we were on the one hand treating cancer patients on oncology wards and experiencing uh, back in the 1990s, uh, how um, scarce the ther therapeutic options were. And on the other side, we were working in the lab and learning about the beauty of the immune system uh, and the potential it has. And uh, so the vision was to use the foreignness of cancer cells and leverage the armamentarium of the immune system for tumor rejection. And there were three fields which we defined as our our future uh, research engagement. On the one hand, cancer cell selective targets, and we um, uh, um, uh, engineered a couple of technologies to find such cancer cell selective targets, uh, which could be used for immune therapies. The second area in which we engaged were, was development of potent immune therapy platforms. And the third, understanding that tumors are unique for in each and every patient. Uh, the third field was individualized medicine. In this context, we became interested in cancer vaccines, therapeutic cancer vaccines and platforms. And what we already recognized in the 1990s, comparing different vaccine formats and vaccine platforms was that mRNA is a very versatile platform to deliver genetic information, which is basically uh, the key for vaccination, namely delivering in a suitable form the immunogen against which you want to have an immune response. And mRNA is uh, versatile. It, uh, its production is easy. It's an enzymatic in vitro transcription from a DNA template. You can put mRNA into nanoparticles, which uh, then uh, on the one hand protect uh, from uh, the degradation by ubiquitous RNAs, but also can be engineered to, um, to bring the mRNA to uh, the place you want uh, to target it to. And for vaccines, obviously, this place are dendritic cells. Even though we understood that mRNA has a great potential, we also realized that uh, a lot of effort had to be invested in order to make mRNA uh, suitable for preventive and therapeutic use in humans. And um, this was uh, an endeavor for which we invested more than two decades and a number of discoveries, a number of modifications, a number of improvements. Uh, what I would like to do uh, on the next couple of slides is to highlight three areas in which uh, we um, invested efforts to um, make um, mRNA therapeutics feasible. Uh, one area was um, in principle the key um, disadvantage of mRNA. Um, mRNA, if you bring it from outside into a cell, uh, has to compete against all the gazillion other mRNA molecules in this cell, uh, which are translated at the ribosome. And if it comes from the outside, it um, activates a primal defense mechanism, toll-like receptors, other innate sensors of, of, of uh, mRNA. And this then leads to even uh, um, a stronger stalled translation of mRNA. So we needed to do something to address 
the short half-life of mRNA in the cell and uh, also the poor translational efficiency, the AUC, so to say, of protein produced from that. And what we um, found out was that the non-coding elements of mRNA can be tweaked and designed to give mRNA, so to say, a VIP pass at the ribosome, meaning to increase the half-life of the mRNA so that more molecules of protein can be translated and also the translational efficiency, so the potency of protein translation, and by this, then also the potency of an mRNA vaccine. Uh, the synthetic mRNA, which is used for vaccination, basically looks identical to um, mature processed cellular uh, mRNA. That means it has a cap, it has untranslated regions, it has a poly a tail. And by high throughput screenings and penning experiments, we found uh, in a systematic approach, caps and pre-prime UTRs and poly R tail designs and lengths, which allowed us to get this better translational performance. And as you can see, even the length of the poly R tail and which cap you use has an effect on the protein uh, translation. Um, there is another way how you can address um, uh, the poor translational efficiency of mRNA, which was pursued by our colleagues, Kati Carico and uh, Drew Weissman. Uh, they um, uh, addressed the fact that uh, defense mechanisms of mRNA stall mRNA translation. And they understood that the reason for this are the uridins. Uh, one of the nucleotides of the uh, four-letter code of mRNA. And if you um, use uridine-containing mRNA, the innate immune sensors bind this and stall mRNA translation. But if you um, uh, substitute the uridine by other naturally occurring nucleosides, such as, for example, pseudomethyl uridine, this does not happen and you get good mRNA translation, and the same effect we got by modifying the non-translated non elements of mRNA. At that time, I have to admit, we were not very interested in this type of technology because we were really focused on using mRNA as a vaccine for uh, for a tumor spheropartically. So there was a lot of tumor mass and we needed a strong immune response. And we wanted to benefit from the excellent intrinsic atrovanticity of mRNA. And therefore all our cancer therapies are based on uridine mRNA. I may add here um, um, the modification of the non-translated elements was done in human dendritic cells because this is really cell uh, type specific and was an important part of our approach. The, so the second area in which um, uh, we, we worked uh, extensively uh, was um, the um, identification of lipid-based envelopes, uh, so delivery technologies for bringing mRNA into dendritic cells and not only any dendritic cell, dendritic cells in lymphatic compartments. Because these are the places, the professional and natural places in which priming of strong T cell ex, uh, uh, responses and, and expansion of T cells, CD4 and CD8 T cells takes place. What we had um, observed uh, was that the, there is an impact of the delivery route uh, on vaccine-induced T cell response. Back in those times, there were already cancer vaccination trials ongoing in patients with peptides, for example. And the approach, the delivery route, which was used was intradermal or subcutaneous. And what we found out was that uh, this um, results not in, in uh, 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 meaningful T cell responses against the used antigen, only if we injected 
the mRNA into lymph nodes, into lymphoid compartments. And this was uh, done in mice by uh, basically surgical uh, means. Uh, then uh, we get good immune responses, CD8 cells, expanded in those injected lymph nodes, but also circulating in blood, in blood and spleen, so being active systemically. And the T cell responses were really strong. Uh, this, these are injected lymph nodes, and you see a strong proliferation of CD4 and CD8 T cells against the vaccine antigen, which was injected. What we also found out that this is a very fast process, mRNA, naked mRNA, not enveloped in any way, injected into the lymph node is taken up very fast. So within the first couple of dozen minutes into certain cells, everything which is not taken up is degraded by RNAs. But this accumulation in cells is very strong and very fast. And these cells are uh, resident dendritic cells, CD11B positive cells. And we also found out that this mechanism of uptake is macropinocytosis. It can be entirely inhibited by rotlerin as immune responses induced by this methodology. Um, this was an important finding that macropinocytosis is a constitu constitutional natural mechanism uh, for take up uh, of such mRNA. And the, we uh, tested this in humans as well, injected into lymph nodes, naked mRNA, which can be done under ultrasound control, and found out that, that the mechanisms are the same there and immune responses are induced in a very strong and unprecedented way. So we asked the question is if injecting a single lymph node uh, via this mechanism ends up in a strong immune response, shouldn't the um, targeting of all lymphatic compartments in the body not be even more potent for vaccine induction? And um, therefore, we defined as a next uh, upgrade uh, uh, project uh, to um, uh, develop a liposomal combination, with, uh, a liposomal formulation in which we could envelope the mRNA, inject intravenously, but target these liposomes very, in a very selective way into lymph, uh, lymph node uh, or lymphatic compartment resident dendritic cells. And we used the concept that macropinocytosis as a mechanism can help us and we, need, uh, we would need the spe specifications for those liposome mRNA lipoplexes or nanoparticles, which would support macropinocytotic uptake. Um, experimenting with different liposomal combinations in mice, we found that a dotma dopey formulated mRNA, and these are lipids which are already used in the clinic, which is contraintuitively um, uh, in terms of charge close to neutral and medium sized and with low polydispersity. Nanoparticles of this uh, specs allow us to prevent the first pass effect and expression uptake and the expression of the antigen in the lung, which normally happens when you inject intravenously such nanoparticles. But what we actually get with this, these specific nanoparticles is accumulation selectively in lymphatic compartments, for, for example, the spleen, which is the largest one, and their expression in, lymph, in the resident dendritic cells. And we could show this with uh, depletion experiments. We only get strong immune responses and also expression of the respective protein uh, in, um, uh, in, uh, if we don't de deplete resident cells. And this is not only in the spleen, but also in lymph nodes body-wide and in the bone marrow. And um, we found out that these RNA lipoplexes uh, in mice um, uh, uh, induce strong immune responses. 
They are, as I said, primarily translated in dendritic cells resident in lymphatic compartments. Uh, the RNA brings in its, um, adjuvant, its intrinsic adjuvanticity, namely that it binds, single-stranded mRNA binds to um, TLR7, TLR8, but also other innate immune sen sensors. And this triggers a very strong uh, but distinct um, uh, cytokine uh, signature dominated by interferon gamma uh, response. And this again results in potent induction of antigen specific T cells, as we have shown in different models, and translates also in different to treat tumor models to anti tumor response uh, and to growth inhibition of tumors. So we decided to bring this uh, concept into clinical testing. And this uh, uh, one of our first studies uh, was uh, in melanoma patients, patients with advanced melanoma, where we used a combination of four different uh, melanoma associated tumor antigens, uh, which collectively um, uh, are expressed or cover 95% uh, of melanoma patients. And uh, this was a phase one, two st uh, study in which uh, also we tested uh, different dose levels, tested this vaccine uh, as uh, monotherapy, but also combined with anti-PD-1 uh, compounds, which uh, are um, uh, approved in, in this setting uh, and assessed immune responses and, um, uh, and also uh, anti-tumor responses in this, uh, in this heterogeneous patient population. First of all, it was uh, encouraging for us to see that in terms of mode of action, which we had described in mouse models, we uh, could see the same effects uh, in humans on three different levels. One level uh, was that we could see shortly after injecting the mRNA systemically, um, after a couple of hours, metabolic activity by PET-CT in uh, spleen, um, uh, which uh, uh, indicated that we have a mobilization, a proliferation of, of immune cells, similar as uh, we have seen in mouse. We could also reproduce um, uh, the intrinsic adjuvanticity of uh, the mRNA. Uh, this is uh, data from one patient who uh, uh, in weekly intervals received increasing doses of the vaccine uh, low doses, as you can see, this is how potent our platform is. And what we could see is a um, uh, 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 dose dependent increase of exactly the uh, same uh, cytokine profile, interferon alpha and gamma dominated uh, uh, cytokine profile in these patients. Uh, not supraphysiological, so that we did not induce cytokine release syndromes, and pulsatile, so this peaked two to four, uh, within two to four uh, hours after vaccination and was back to uh, normal in, uh, within 24 hours, uh, but uh, uh, in a way that we could the required activation uh, of immune responses on top of the antigen we had presented via the vaccine. And indeed, on the third level now, we were able to induce T cell responses. And this, for example, uh, is um, the T cell response against one epitope of one of the antigens this patient's, patient has been uh, immunized with, uh, with. We have polytopic immune responses. So this is really only a fraction. And what we observe that even this one fraction of the polytopic uh, immune response is um, up to 10% of, uh, uh, of the circulating CD8 cells of this patient. Uh, so these are dimensions you know, normally uh, seek to reach with adoptive T cell uh, transfer. So this was very encouraging. What we also observed was clinical activity. These were very advanced patients. And this is a, a subset from this a study in which we treated more than 100 patients, namely patients who had stage 4 disease 
uh, at uh, uh, inclusion into this uh, trial uh, and had been heavily pretreated, including checkpoint inhibitors, and were now receiving the vaccine in combination with a checkpoint in inhibitor or not. And as you can see here, there is a strong um, uh, clinical activity with target lesions, which are regressing and uh, some patients having durable immune responses. In the recommended phase two dose, we selected uh, 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 in a patient subset with anti-PD-1 refractory and resistant disease we saw in combination with anti-PD-1 uh, tumor, uh, an objective response rate, rate, uh, rate of 35%, which with standard of care would be 10%. And uh, this trial now has led to a randomized phase two trial uh, for which we will have data uh, this year. So the third area in which uh, we uh, invested efforts was towards the vision of developing individualized, truly individualized cancer vaccines that are really tailor-made for each patient um, uh, on demand, so to say. And the basis for this is that uh, the most interesting tumor associated tumor antigens are somatic cancer mutations. That means really mutations which happen in the cancer are not expressed anywhere else. They are highly selective and there is no immune tolerance against which you have to work. And these um, tumor uh, cancer mutations can give rise to neoantigens when they create uh, binding motifs for MHC class one and MHC class two. Uh, the drawback here is that uh, cancer mutations are randomly, uh, uh, happen randomly over time and therefore are highly individual to patients and a very good platform to be used for highly individualized immune therapies. And what that really means is that uh, you take a sample of a tumor from this patient who is newly diagnosed uh, and a PBMC sample as normal counterpart, next generation sequencing is performed to identify the mutanome, so the entire entirety of mutated uh, uh, of mutations in this patient's cancer and every cancer look different in there. If you want to do this on an individualized level, highly sensitive, highly specific, you have to develop specific bioinformatical mutation detection tools. So we had to invest efforts in that. Uh, then we have developed a computational pipeline, which allows us to predict which of these mutations bind to the polymorphic MHC class one and MHC class two alleles of this patient, what, uh, which of them are highly expressed, which of them are from genes with which are uh, from proteins which are specifically prone uh, to have an effect uh, when targeted with T cell responses, etc. And we use this data in order to select uh, in that uh, case um, um, uh, uh, 20 uh, mutations per patient and, and engineer based on our improved mRNA platform a vaccine on demand tailor-made for this patient. And this is uh, just uh, the first clinical, uh, clinical trial, which we started in 2014, mm -hmm. uh, which was pu published in 2017 with 13 patients with localized um, uh, 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 inoperable uh, or um, stage four uh, metastatic uh, melanoma. And what we had observed by by uh, immunizing uh, these patients with their uh, uh, unique uh, neoantigens uh, is shown here, some clinical activity. These are the 13 patients and we mapped the recurrences the metastatic relapses of these patients prior in the two years prior start of the vaccination and after start of the vaccination. And if you look to, into this cumulatively, uh, you find out that uh, um, the uh, number of, uh, the cumulative number of relapses of these patients 
has dropped under vaccination um, uh, uh, dramatically. And we have still um, now for five, six years, uh, these patients under follow up and several of them are still uh, alive and in fact have those T cell uh, responses we have generated in them, those against the neoantigens, uh, which are in the meantime effect on memory phenotype. The challenges for um, uh, uh, establishing individualized mRNA vaccines are not only scientific ones. Uh, you have to bring uh, such a vaccine um, uh, uh, manufacturing and all the computational part of it and so on into a clinical practice setting, which is challenging and you need for each and every step basically uh, an SOP, a standard operation procedure, which is validated. And this is uh, sort of the flow. Each of these boxes has an entire process, which is well defined uh, um, uh, in it, uh, and standard operation procedure. And uh, on the next slide, I want to show you for this part, which is just the biobank. So getting the samples which give the information for engineering the, uh, the vaccine for these for this patient, extracting the mRNA out of them, doing the next generation sequencing. This all has to be documented. So what I will show you on the next slide refers only to this, namely on this slide, this is 2014, the inspection of a regulatory authority, which visited us and wanted to see all the documentation. And this is the documentation for one patient only for that part of the entire process. So there was a lot to read for those people when they visited us for in inspection. And at that time, we had to do the manufacturing all manually under GMP uh, for ICE principle and so on. So the lead time for getting a vaccine for one patient was, yeah, rarely under three months because of all this which needed to be handled. We improved over time and end of 2019, the lead time by paperless documentation and semi-automatic manufacturing, et cetera, was down to three to six weeks per patient. So um, basically needle to needle uh, time taking uh, the biosamples, processing all that and delivering the vaccine of unique composition for this patient uh, to be uh, injected. And um, in the meantime, uh, we have treated hundreds of patients with our individualized vaccine all over the world, each of them with an individual composition. We don't have any one vaccine which is identical for, uh, for, for two patients, which meant that when the pandemic hit, at uh, that fateful uh, last week, January 2020, when we realized uh, we are in principle already with, in the midst of a pandemic, we thought this is some technology which um, we maybe we can use it to contribute to a pandemic emergency vaccine development because this race against each patient's tumor through which we had to go hundreds of times in the context of our individualized cancer vaccine, had taught us so much uh, to be also um, uh, uh, ready uh, for an emergency vaccine development for COVID-19. Um, two weeks before we started, the SARS-CoV-2 genetic sequence was already published, uh, um, uh, which was really a blessing. Uh, for, for everyone, uh, we uh, started then um, our mRNA vac vaccine program. Uh, we, uh, there were so many unknowns, so that we started uh, preclinically with 20 different vaccine candidates and funneled them through preclinical lab and animal uh, studies. Um, in uh, three months later, uh, we had uh, boiled this down to four candidates which went into a phase one testing uh, in, um, uh, in Germany, starting in Germany. We used the time to forge alliances 
with um, companies uh, who could complement what we as a small German company did not have. So big machineries to conduct um, uh, global clinical trials in 10,000s of people uh, in different regions of the world, uh, manufacturing capacities later for commercial supply in the case of success and uh, so on so that we had uh, our colleagues Pfizer on board and, and Fossum, Fossum for, for China uh, on board uh, and they pitched in into the, uh, into the clinical trials. The phase one slash phase two uh, testing allowed us to identify the candidate BNT162B2 aka Comirnaty, uh, which um, proved to be the best of best in our candidate list to go, go into a phase three trial, which uh, started in, in summer 2020. And in November uh, 2020, uh, we had our data from a, a large phase three trial, global phase three trial, which showed that we in fact had, had a functioning vaccine and a vaccine which was highly potent with an efficacy rate of 95%. Uh, we had pl planned for success. This is the only thing you can do in a, uh, in a, des a desperate situation. So we had started to talk to the regulatory authorities all over the world very early on and uh, had uh, um, uh, started also rolling submissions. We had uh, ramped up manufacturing capacities, has, have had bought manufacturing plants and so on. Everything at risk risk as a uh, anyway cash burn company at that time. Uh, so it was really a risky situation also for that, uh, which allowed us to be prepared also for success. And in the meantime, more than 1 billion people have been vaccinated in more than 170 regions with our vaccine. And we hear that millions of deaths could be avoided. What was important for, for us from the very beginning was that we induce a um, holistic immune response. So um, T cells as well as antibodies. Uh, in the pharmaceutical industry against um, um, respiratory uh, viruses, there is a very strong um, uh, focus on virus neutralizing antibodies, which are definitely important in, in, in particular to prevent uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection and also transmission. But um, uh, we have, as MDs know that uh, also thinking of disease and severe disease and hospitalization and death is important, important and here is where T cells come to play. So this uh, was an important part of that and how we selected our final candidate. Our final candidate, uh, BNT162B2, has the entire, encodes for the entire spike protein of the virus and uh, it is mutated uh, so that it's conformational, conformationally stabilized. And that piece that docks on on the cellular receptor to ACE2 is stabilized uh, and, 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 and is uh, um, uh, erected so that antibody bodies against this important part can be generated. Uh, there was some drama backstage uh, because um, it was very clear we could not use our wonderful um, um, uh, uh, intravenous RNA lipoplex formulation, such a vaccine in particular in a pandemic situation has to be administered intramuscularly so we, that we had to um, use a different formulation. And this formulation, which we found um, uh, with, a, uh, with a cooperation partner, Acuitas, had some own intrinsic adjuvanticity. It was not as inert as uh, our lipoplexus, which meant that we had to boil down the sort of total uh, uh, adjuvanticity and go with nucleoside modified mRNA, mRNA uh, and basically redesign um, uh, the entire formulation part. Um, what we kept in mind when we designed these new nanoparticles was the need to get this to lymphatic compartments and to the uh, dendritic cells there. So for the design of these new nanoparticles, we took in account, uh, uh, um, uh, we had in mind 
all the specs we needed for these nanoparticles to be uh, to travel via lymphatic uh, lymphatics to uh, lymphoid uh, compartments and taken up by dendritic cells there. And as you can see here, even though we inject the mRNA into uh, uh, nanoparticles, into the muscle, the mRNA itself and also the protein is not detected in the injected muscle, but, in, uh, but is uh, detected and expressed in the lymphoid compartments in exactly the right cells. And uh, on the one hand, this is the delivery, how we construct the nanoparticles, but it is also the selection of the non-coding parts uh, on which I had already alluded, which are, have been designed such that they are favored by dendritic cells and not other cell types. So what we saw already in our uh, phase one study was, yes, even at lowest doses, our vaccine induces not only binding antibodies, but also virus neutralizing uh, antibodies. We need two doses for this. Um, we decided to, uh, to go with uh, two doses of 30 micrograms, 21 days apart. 21 days uh, is not something, it's, a bit short for an immunologist, but we were in a pandemic. So um, uh, this was not about immunologically optimizing, but optimizing for the purpose. And this dose also induces strong CD4 and CD8 T cell responses, which are after uh, also some time uh, comparable to recall responses to common uh, 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 viruses like EBV and CMV, CMV and, uh, uh, CMV and uh, flu as shown here. Um, the effect of all this was that, that in our phase three trial, as I said, we could show 95% efficacy. Uh, and we treated 20,000 uh, patients with placebo uh, and 20,000 approximately with our vaccine and uh, could see a case split of 8 to 162 uh, cases of symptomatic validated uh, um, um, uh, 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 COVID-19 disease. And this translated to a 95% efficacy also in the older population, which was maintained um, uh, over a longer duration, 91%, still after six months. Um, we understood very early on that just by developing the vaccine and being able to deploy it, our job probably is not done, but we have the responsibility, the radical responsibility to stay on board and think about what might come in future. And already at that time, the question was, how long will the du duration of um, uh, this uh, uh, vaccination be? When do we lose uh, protection by this vaccine? Um, this is obviously very strongly entangled with another question, namely, how will the virus evolve? And therefore, to be prepared for what may come, we installed very early on already in 2021, once we had this vaccine uh, in its first version uh, going, uh, a system, uh, um, a process for us. First of all, we developed an uh, uh, in, in, in artificial intelligence or machine learning based early warning system, which would uh, use all the sequences which are made uh, public, for example, by GISIDE uh, of uh, circulating viruses, uh, virus variants uh, worldwide, and assess each of them for um, how fit they are. Uh, to infect, to bind to the cellular receptor, but also the uh, likelihood of immune escape. So that we had a tool to uh, stay a step uh, directly behind the, the virus. And what we then did all um, uh, um, uh, 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 variants of concern, which would appear either declared by the WHO or just because we thought this could also be a vaccine of concern, were tested 
with uh, the sera of BNT 162B2 vaccinated individuals in order to look on the antibody neutralizing antibody level for immune escape. And um, everything was fine until Omicron. Uh, BA1 appeared because we could basically always see this type of, of, uh, of um, uh, um, results for the entire part of the alphabet prior Omicron. Um, this, for example, is the uh, Delta variant, which is well uh, still uh, neutralized by BNT 162B2, which is the Wuhan spike, as you know, uh, in uh, antibodies. Uh, the one which bothered us most was the uh, beta uh, uh, variant, but it was still fine. Uh, however, as you can see here, Omicron was under the threshold. So there is no neutralization. What we found out was that a third booster, so a third injection, a vaccination brings this back to protection also against Omicron. So all of a sudden a virus against which two vaccinations were sufficient turned itself by mutating to a variant for which you would need uh, three vaccinations as, as primary series. Um, what uh, was encouraging for, for us was that the T cell epitopes, which we had shown uh, to be CD8 epitopes um, against which uh, our vaccine induces T cells, uh, were um, highly preserved also in Omicron. Uh, so this uh, made us uh, sleep better at night because we knew that there is some protection at least against severe disease death hospitalization. However, it was very clear to us and at some point also to regulators and governments that an adaptation of the vaccine is needed to the variants. So exchanging the Wuhan spike against the B, uh, Omicron BA1 spike. And we actually immediately started that process last year, November, uh, were sort of slowed down a bit by the regulators because uh, the uh, requirements were extensive clinical trials and so on. And uh, the manufacturing part was easy for us because we had trained this hundreds of times with our individualized cancer vaccines. So what we observed in our clinical trial, and this is only the uh, preliminary analysis, we have in the meantime, the final analysis and in fact, all the data is with the regulators and there are the first approvals for this adapted vaccine going on uh, in different regions. So what we observed was that against BA1, which was sort of the declared enemy, we get with our vaccine uh, as a monovalent vaccine, but also if we mix uh, the uh, monovalent Omi, uh, Omicron vaccine with the BNT162B2, very nice immune responses. Uh, the sad news, unfortunately, was that even though we had succeeded with our milestone to develop a vaccine against BA1, in the meantime, the virus had not waited for us to do this, but had continued to mutate. And as you all know, we have BA4, BA5 dominance in the meantime in almost all regions. Uh, we say BA4, 5 because both variants have the same spike. It's the same spike, only other parts are different. And um, we could show that unfortunately, um, the BA1 adapted vaccine did not work as well anymore against um, uh, BA45 uh, in the monovalent as well in the bivalent form. Um, and um, here's just uh, a part of uh, the virus spikes of uh, both variants compared, which shows that BA1 uh, against which all the current vaccine uh, adapt variant adapted vaccines have been developed uh, is different in terms of mutation profile quite considerably as compared to BA2 derived lineages, sublineages, which are, for example, BA45. Uh, 
So that means we, uh, again, it's not only a scientific challenge, the challenge we have as a community, as a global community, is also a regulatory pathways, which still are not adapted for the pandemic situation with a, a fast uh, mutating virus. Uh, the pathway which we have to follow, which we had to also follow for the BA1 variant, uh, means clinical data, and that takes eight months to develop, to, uh, to have a regulatory package ready. What we had proposed and continue to propose is to go without the clinical data, but with the preclinical model data and CMC, exactly as we do in our cancer vaccine patients for which every time n equals one without previous studies, only that way we can cope with the fast following variants. So, so there are regulatory challenges and there were also manufacturing challenges already in the early times of this vaccine development. In 2019, we were able uh, planning for our cancer trials to produce 10,000 10, doses when we engaged um, uh, of vaccine per year. When we engaged into COVID-19 vaccine development, it was clear to us uh, this, there has to be more supply. And uh, we um, up, turned every stone, basically, and uh, uh, managed to upscale to 25 million doses of vaccine. And then uh, during 2020, we realized that many of our peers, more than a dozen of companies, has started vaccine development early 2020, and many of them had to give up because this is really not a trivial job to do. And it was clear that there would be even a higher burden uh, on us and we had to deliver. So that 2021, uh, we managed to upscale to 3 billion uh, doses and still upscaling, which as you can imagine also meant innovation. Um, uh, and investment into discoveries and, and, and uh, inventions. Um, there is another challenge with which we had to uh, um, uh, uh, socialize ourselves uh, and which sort of changed our perspective as yeah, a small company in Germany as, uh, as which we started, namely the challenge of vaccine equality. Yeah. We, we all know that in those regions where this vaccine, other vaccines are needed most, um, uh, uh, people don't get the vac uh, these uh, vaccines. We address this by um, uh, distributing at cost uh, vaccines into um, low middle income countries, 40% of what we have produced went into those countries that way. But we think that we need to enable those people there and help them to build their own vaccine hubs produced for themselves. And this is also something into which we have invested with what we call a Biontainer concept. So um, we have miniaturized <clears throat> our production processes um, this is also part, uh, this comes also from our individualized cancer vaccine efforts, so that they fit into uh, containers and um, are fully automatized. And we are building these containers, equipping them with all what is needed, doing test runs, qualifying them from a reg regulatory or validation perspective in our plans, and then ship them and want to ship them, so this is the plan, want to ship them around the world. The first steps have, an, so that they can at the target location then be built and uh, um, uh, qualification runs can be done locally and uh, uh, production can then happen uh, in uh, those uh, locations. And um, we have started with that on the African continent. A couple of weeks ago, we had the groundbreaking for such a facility uh, in, um, uh, in Kigali, in Rwanda, uh, with uh, support of the African Union, with the WHO. And uh, the African continent 
is really mobilized uh, and uh, has also implement, is implementing their first own regulatory authority, which will also be located in Kigali. So that this will be a very interesting uh, joint program uh, to find out whether such concepts work. So um, this is the journey of mRNA technology from cancer to infectious diseases, and it will definitely go back with everything it has learned to cancer again. And with this, I would like to thank you for your interest and acknowledge uh, only this sort of tip of the iceberg of people who have contributed to this work. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. This was uh, an incredible journey in such a small time. And the people tend to forget that there are two decades of development before. Yes. And that was not possible without the hard work, daily work for many. So this is something I want to say to many people. The technology was right in the moment it was perfect. Absolutely. And uh, not only our work, generations of scientists uh, have um, uh, built the foundation. Uh, so um, this does, did not come from nowhere. Exactly. <laughs> so we have time for questions. Uh, actually, I don't know if, uh, if there are questions from the audience. Because... No, nothing in the chat. Okay, so I was... Um, there are many um, applications. Uh, uh, for example, one, one, one which is obvious uh, is development of um, infectious disease vaccines in a broader way. We have now the, the, the um, pandemic situation, uh, a pandemic vaccine, which is very special, but there are also other neglected diseases where we don't have um, vaccines and malaria, tuberculosis are only examples for that. And one of the draw, the, one of the hurdles there is that these diseases are so complex that uh, you need even to test different antigens in order to find out which are the best tests in humans to proceed with vaccine development. And mRNA is so is so versatile that it is not a problem at all to. Um, make an entire battery of different antigens, test them in phase one trials. You don't have what comes with recombinant protein technology, where for each of the antigens, you would need years to express and formulate the protein. Here with the mRNA, you can choose a battery of antigens and two to three months later, you can have all of them in clinical testing in phase one. Uh, that's an advantage. Um, uh, other areas are autoimmune diseases. Um, mRNA, the way we have built it is a toolbox. So you can, uh, we have different um, uh, 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 non-coding elements, uh, with which we can tweak whether we have long expression, short expression, pulsatile expression. We can um, assemble uh, the mRNA and the liposomal formulation such that we uh, don't um, um, expand CD8 T cells, but expand antigen specific T Rex which would mean applications in the autoimmune uh, realm uh, where we uh, have projects ongoing for multiple sclerosis, for example, because antigen specific tolerance induction 
uh, has a, a very broad uh, space where you can use it. Um, other uh, um, um, areas are, for example, rejuvenation, uh, because many of um, organ or, um, uh, aging processes come from inflammation. So suppress those uh, inflamed tissues are also an application. So very broad. Uh, I, I'll try. Machine learning be used to predict further developments of the of the virus. Could you use machine learning to predict rather than to be one step behind the virus? And another thing that I'm wondering is you you mentioned the cancer vaccine, but when you mean vaccine, you mean like you prevent the the, the, the formation of the dust and the century. Uh, I, I, yes, it's therapeutic vaccines, obviously, so the cancer is already there. And uh, there are uh, um, different spaces where you can position cancer vaccines. We are very much interested in the minimal residual disease setting, so um, uh, post adjuvant treatment, for example, where, for example, in colorectal cancer, we identify stage two high risk, stage three patients uh, with colorectal cancer. And after curative surgery, uh, uh, they go into a watchful waiting, as you know, as standard, so to say, uh, in our uh, vaccine arm, we vaccinate them. That I think is a perfect setting because immune therapy is a numbers game. If you have a load to more load, uh, that's even more promising. But there's also the metastatic setting where in particular with anti-PD-1 combination, uh, we see objective response rates. So there it would be about uh, complete remission uh, responses or partial responses. And by continued vaccination, maintaining those T cells alive and controlling the tumor growth. And the first question was uh, machine learning. Can yeah. Say that we are one step behind the virus for SARS CoV 2. So, because you're using machine learning to predict once where the sequence is, which would be the sequence that will most likely be the, most, the next dominant one. So, could you use machine learning to be one step ahead rather than one step behind? So, start to predict the confirmation of the spike protein to expect what the solution that. that. Yes, we and also others are playing around with that, but uh, we are not sure whether the biological reality is such that um, uh, uh, technology allows us uh, to use, for example, machine learning for predicting what will happen. What we see is with the current um, machine learning tools or databases, which we have uh, that there is quite still some mutational space for the virus to change. Uh, we would not have predicted BA45 now, because what happened is the virus went back in the NTD domain and sort of lost what it had acquired in terms of mutations uh, for Omicron BA1 and looks more like Delta again. Uh, and this is not because of recombination, this is not a segmented virus, it's because it uh, acted contraintuitively, it appears. So there are things we might not pick up and not be able to reflect in machine learning tools, which does not mean that we shouldn't try and learn, and this is what we are doing. Francesco? Going back to the translation of the I was curious, uh, like uh, your opinion about uh, uh, the platform that you established uh, and all the uh, issues that you already overcome in uh, to make available a personal vaccine for these patients. However, uh, for any kind of treatment, uh, there are people that respond better than the others. Uh, and I guess this is happens uh, as well for this kind of problem. So, uh, couple of good questions. The first is uh, how you can uh, manage uh, in a short time uh, in order to understand which are the patients that are good responders. So if you can find any uh, predictive biomarkers for 
start calling new response or something else to predict the fact that will uh, respond better to the treatment. <coughs> and uh, in general, in the, in the patients uh, that uh, say hating or not getting the best uh, results from this treatment, uh, which are usually the issues? Is it about uh, activation of a tumor specific in response or is it about uh, the tumor uh, cell infiltration inside the tumor or is it because of immunosuppression or is it because uh, uh, of the evolution of the tumor that is using uh, antigen presentation or antibodies in the Yes, these are uh, important questions and uh, uh, should be and uh, and in our case also are parts of a clinical development program to um, collect as many as possible meaningful full biomarker data points and characterize them and meta analyze them because uh, in general doing this in only one study is not sufficient it needs to be validated uh, across different uh, sort of cohorts um, we are doing that. We um, uh, have uh, indications which um, might also be obvious uh, what predictive markers uh, might be. Uh, cold tumors um, uh, uh, respond less well as compared to, uh, to, to hot tumors. Uh, Mutation-rich tumors uh, respond better. So there are a couple of, uh, of observations. Uh, but it really needs more data in order to sort of build a narrative out of it and make it actionable for the for the clinical setting. Other questions? Let's see if there is any. It says, "Can I make a question?" Yes, oh, you yeah. can. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, oh can you yes. Hear you? I thought <laughs> okay. So yeah, I'm just a voice. Um, so I have a, actually a basic question on the mechanism of uh, the vaccine. So you said the mRNA is uptaken preferentially by dendritic cells. So I guess that the antigen is also made endogenously by dendritic cells. And do you have a specific strategy uh, that are, uh, is enhancing uh, MSC class two presentation of those antigen that are made endogenously in dendritic cells? Yes, we in fact have. Uh, that's part of, of uh, uh, the optimization of, of mRNA backbones. That, so the first, uh, first part of the three uh, parts uh, of, of, of efforts I have described. Uh, what we uh, have observed is that uh, if, uh, we if, if we use um, uh, a secretory domain yeah. uh, in front of uh, of uh, the respective antigen, uh, so so um, uh, n terminally and c terminally, the in uh, the uh, the intramembrane and intracellular domain part of an MHC class one molecule, we get uh, on the one hand uh, CD4 responses, uh, so presentation of MHC class or on MHC class one, uh, MHC class two, which is not the case uh, for this uh, exogenously delivered mRNA, uh, otherwise in dendritic cells. And we also get an increase, a strong enhancement of the MHC class one response. So there is also a tinkering uh, in uh, the design which increases MHC class one and MHC class two responses. Okay, thank you. Um, I do have one last question. Um, no, okay. Oh, there is another question, so it's not last. Okay, you, you go first. Uh, thank, uh, thank you so much for your talk. That was, that was so much better than the other one. Uh, I was just wondering in terms of the cancer vaccines, um, have there been any significant side effects um, as well? Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, um, uh, we, we had to do a dose finding, obviously. Uh, we have defined 50 to 100 microgram um, per 
uh, vaccination uh, as, as our dose because we see very strong immune responses and it is well tolerated at that dose. Uh, we have treated um, more than 400 patients uh, uh, with cancer with this dose. The patients are getting an um, initial vaccination series weekly of six vaccinations, uh, six shots. And thereafter, every six uh, weeks for one year and then every three months, uh, injections of a vaccine. That means we not only have sort of the one dose data, we also have follow up dose data for quite some repetitive administrations. And there are patients who have received this um, for four, five years. So the discussion around uh, COVID-19 vaccine and long-term data in for the cancer vaccine, we, we have that. And the vaccine is uh, well tolerated. We see um, reactogenicity. So patients can have fever, chills, uh, this can also be grade free, so that you really give, need to give something which is uh, 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 against the fever, fever and the chills or fatigue um, or uh, arthralgia. So everything which is sort of flu-like, which is understandable with the intrinsic atroventicity, uh, it is manageable. Uh, and uh, can be, for example, treated with um, uh, paracetamol uh, so that um, uh, we uh, even consider to uh, um, uh, develop the vaccine uh, for community hospitals, for example, uh, on an outpatient basis. Yeah, we, we are working on mucosal vaccines. Uh, we are experimenting with uh, other types of formulations, for example, for nasal vaccines, also in the COVID-19 setting. And uh, that's obviously a field into which one, one should invest uh, some, some efforts uh, because we cannot answer yet uh, um, uh, how, how much mucosal immunity we get with all the uh, in, uh, intramuscularly administered vaccines. From real world data, we know that BNT162b2 is, has also a strong infection protective uh, um, uh, component. So um, if uh, the mucosa plays an uh, important role there, we might induce some immunity also there, uh, migrating T cells, for example. Well, if there is no other question, I would like to close this excellent lecture. Thank you. Again, thanking you again. And I will just um, remind that uh, Stefano Wujel is uh, responsible for a project collaboration ongoing with BioNTech uh, within the framework of the National uh, Center for uh, RNA Therapy that was uh, recently supported by um, Next Generation EU of funding in Italy. And this will be about uh, autoimmune diseases as possible potential application extension. So again, thank you very much for coming. And I think everybody is excited to have listened to a piece of history. <laughs>